Hello, and welcome to episode 33 of the Power Score LSAT podcast. I'm Dave Kalorn in Napa Valley. And this is John Denning in Los Angeles. The beautiful Los Angeles. How are things in LA today? It is truly beautiful down here. Things are good. I'm in a weirdly philosophical mood. I don't know how much that's going to convey. We'll see what happens. I think your many fans on Reddit will be glad to hear that. They would like to hear your insights. (laughs) <laughs> All right, so to, to actually bring a bit of symmetry to this, uh, one of my best girlfriends, a girl I just adore to pieces, she, it's like your daughter than her, she has gone through a bad breakup recently in Charleston, South Carolina. I won't mention her name, but I've been recording every night five to eight minutes of just truths, facts, things I know about the world, about the universe <laughs> that I, I know. <laughs> it's it's comical in principle. It's profound in execution. You see, the thing is, I know who you really are. So what? who's oh, this no. guy that's talking right now? No, so this guy right now. <laughs> for instance, Dave, did you know that in the one or so seconds since I started the sentence, your body has produced about a million red blood cells? And they're going to bang around and scatter and take oxygen to the places that it needs. But for her sake, know that anytime you doubt yourself, there's an army inside you. <laughs> yeah, I see what I'm doing? Yeah, yeah you're I've making doing, me laugh. I've been doing this. I know, I know. I, th- I know you find it funny. Serious she, question, though. Yeah, I have a serious what, question for you what, about what you just what said. Is, what is it? What drugs are you on right now? <laughs> <laughs> Not enough. Not enough. Uh, <laughs> I wonder about you sometimes. <laughs> yeah, you should. Well, in but anyway, drugs, I've been doing this. I've been doing this for every night. And I, I think it's. Great. It's very kind of you. It's completely yeah. out of character. So I'm worried about you now. I'll send you the recordings. You're not that part nice. Part of me, yeah. Part of me wonders if I should just upload them online. Part of me also <laughs> suspects that that would kill all my credibility. Uh, that was killed long ago. <laughs> so we're already there. But thanks. Let's, buddy. let's talk about what you're drinking because at least that's something that, that is, would explain you know, solidly things. in the real world. Yeah, that would explain certainly. Uh, so I've been on an old fashioned kick uh, of the past, well, forever. But Have you been last... writing letters too while you. <laughs> yes, Why don't you just write her a letter instead of like recording anything? That's a truly old fashioned. My fashion. dearest Elizabeth. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I did just give her name. Oh, shit. Um, so, oh, yeah, old-fashioned kicked. Uh, and I I don't know. I don't know. I just think they're great. You've they've ordered been, them many times. Yeah, they've been, been keeping me the warm. Town. Keep me warm. Well, I What have, about you, buddy? I'm actually drinking something that I, maybe I've had once or twice before, but not often. And it kind of connects to the theme of the day. Mm. Today, we're going to do some student questions. So, it's basically a mailbag and a couple of weeks ago, somebody mentioned to me, they're like, you should try this drink. And it is a Paloma. Mm. I can't remember. This is the bad thing here. I can't remember whether it was on Twitter or a forum or Reddit or just an email where it came from. But I was like, that actually is a great suggestion. And so, a Paloma is a great tequila drink, based. Man. Yeah, it's a great and drink. And that is not something I drink a whole lot of other than margaritas. But we've got Herodura and Nejo here. And that's a really good tequila to me. Mm-hmm. So... It's very smooth and easy enough to drink. So that's what we're using. And then you just like, you mix in like Doritos or something with that. Kind of. Let like me a, guess though. I think your version of this is probably a little bit more involved no. than the typical. It's uh, To me, a Paloma is just tequila and grapefruit. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be just grapefruit because I don't like grapefruit juice. So you put st- something in there. Like I'm using Doritos. Doritos, it's the, uh, it's like the soft drink from Mexico. Okay. But it's the it's the more like grapefruity version of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what like fresca lime? What are you doing? Uh, lime, clearly. <laughs> I have a lime tree, so you do. I'm, I'm always prepared for drinking <laughs> that requires limes. <laughs> <laughs> I should say to anyone out there listening to this, Dave's backyard is a it's an Eden. Frankly, there is an olive tree, a couple Olives, of them, yeah. I think, yeah, um, fig trees. Yep, the dog likes those. Ah, so do I. Yeah, your backyard is just a, an oasis. Well, I mean, I live in Napa. This is like everything grows here. I mean, California, everything grows. <laughs> so it's not like some huge surprise. I'm not in downtown New York like, yeah, I have all these trees in Manhattan. <laughs> well, that's true. I wasn't trying to give you too much credit. <laughs> <I> don't. <laughs> but it is pretty spectacular back there. Thank you. I like it quite a lot. And the slide to your pools, you know. It's not so bad. The dog likes that too. <laughs> 
<laughs> anyway, so someone suggested I get, you know, the mixings for this, and I mostly had it, but uh, not all of it. And so we put it together, and it's pretty good. It's very refreshing. It's yeah. very light. It's very summery, and summer's kind of coming to a close here, so it's kind of like a good send-off. Yeah, it's getting cold up there? Um, Not not too cold, but it's no longer like super heated. We're not seeing 100 degree days anymore, really okay. even 90 that often. Do you need me to send you some recordings of things to keep you warm at night? Please write me a letter. <laughs> <laughs> My dearest David. You have just completely <laughs> set yourself up to be destroyed I know, for I know. months and months. That's going to be send it so by great. P- pony courier. Anyway, um, there is another the thing that's happened in our life. No, 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 no music. Okay, fine. I'm just so excited to talk about a I know you are television event. Before we get there, and it'll actually be a counterpoint. The song <laughs> of the day. It's a classic. Since I do the intro on this, I you wanted to it. drive the song. It's a Britney Spears classic because, of course, I love pop well. in general, and and Britney's hilarious to me. <laughs> but it is her seminal work. You got to work, <laughs> bitch. <laughs> <laughs> I lean into that. Yeah, here we are. <laughs> We're gonna work today, eventually. Eventually, I love no, that that's song. A great though. song. Yeah, it's a great song. I'm not the biggest Britney fan. Um, sorry to disappoint you, but that is a pretty good tune. You know, I feel bad for Britney because I feel like she's been exploited in in her life, and I make that with just no knowledge other than tabloids. Although one of our friends, it was uh, one of his good friends from college that actually ended up dating her for quite a while. So we'd hear stories every once in a blue moon mm-hmm. about that. I just feel, I feel sad for her sometimes, like she's locked in her own prison. But I went to uh, see her show in Vegas. I've seen it like two or three times because Seriously? I'm always- Yeah, I've seen I it a bunch. I'm always there with a bunch of people and they're like, especially the girls are like, let's go see Britney. And I'm like, of course, what am I going to do? I'm going to drink and watch people dance. It sounds fine. I didn't know you had any secrets for me. Is that a secret? It isn't. Well, it's not anymore. But no, I didn't know that about you. I've flown across the ocean to go see Girls Aloud like seven times. Trust me. That I knew and have tried to forget. (laughs) No one can understand that except true (laughs) believers. Yeah. Uh, Anyway, No, I didn't know that about you and Brittany, that you guys have got a a history. My wife actually has funny comments about it because, you know, of course, she used to be a dancer and owned a ballet studio. And so she loves to watch the dancing. And she always says this about watching Brittany. She's like, when they do the opening numbers, the dancers are super sharp. They're very on point. They're killing it. And she goes, when Brittany comes out, they actually, it would be the equivalent of dumbing it down. They begin to be less precise in their movements because otherwise they would make Britney wow. look worse. Wow. And I'm like, this is the kind of stuff, of course, I never see because I'm like, hey, give me another drink. But uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> who's getting drinks now? Get me one. Palomas. <laughs> she's, I... <laughs> she's sitting there and she'll be like, oh, Britney, boy, she used to be better than this. She's lazy. And I'm like, this is great commentary. So That is actually a fantastic insight. I, none of these things I knew. You so can thank enjoy you, anything. Dave, for sharing with me and everyone else. <laughs> I don't know who's ahead on points right now, but I'm pretty sure it's me. <laughs> oh, it's you. You started off it's... negative 100 with, Yikes. I send letters yeah. to oh, <laughs> my friend. <laughs> I don't even know. <laughs> but can something we, else can happened. Can we talk about something that has happened that both of us appreciate? Yeah, I was just Rit- turning to that, but you- uh, Rit- me aside. Yeah. What did well, happen? I'm, I'm eager to get there. Uh, so, and I wonder if this is going to be as polarizing as I suspect. No. But I think it is. Um, a TV show that you and I both have come to really adore. I love it. Rick, Rick and Morty. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which I think is just a a brilliant piece of small screen cinema. Brilliant is the right word. If I might. Um, it premiered on Sunday night. Season four. Season four. Episode one. Summer I- wrecked it. <laughs> Yes. You know what I'm talking about. I do, exactly. But I can't I can't elaborate on that because it would give too much away um, about my own situation. <laughs> that is true. We'll get to that next, please. Come on. I thought we were over it. Anyway, I was very happy to see after what was it, like three years or something? It's been a long time. Yeah. That they had, Dan Harmon had made his triumphant uh, debut, re-debut. And- and returned one of my favorite characters in that series, Mr. Meeseeks. <laughs> he did. <laughs> and a, a slightly like Britney Spears version of that character, um, whose name I forget. But 
Do you remember them doing like a dumbed down Me Six? Yeah, the red one. Yeah, the red one. <laughs> it was some that was I can't the, the brand name that was like it was a very cheap modern. knockoff. It was very oh. Spearsian. Yeah, well, that wasp dinner was really weird. So <laughs> that was my favorite part of the episode. I texted you at that moment, and, you did. and I was like, "This is epic." <laughs> That was great. And for the 99.9% of the audience that has no idea what Rick and Morty is, it's great. Yeah. Look it, it is up. animated. And it's funny because I'm not, I don't consider myself like a huge animation fan. Hmm. But between that and South Park, those are like two of my favorite shows to watch. So, South Park's having a pretty good episode or a run, whatever, this year, too. So they're always having a good run. Those guys Tegrity. are also Integrity Farms. Integrity Farms. <laughs> Anti China. Very interesting. <laughs> yeah. They're taking it to them, and I respect I that. Wish, I wish I could quote what they said. Uh, I can't, to keep this PG. Fair enough. Yeah. We already said bitch, though. I did. Uh, and I, yeah, I think I used another word earlier, too. So, we're not off to a great start. Well, speaking of, you know, not off to a great start, <laughs> we know you're single now, Come and I've seen man. there's some talk about it online. Come on, man. Spivey offered a date with you. I did didn't he? know you guys were together. I mean, actually, I actually did miss that. Uh, <laughs> otherwise, I'd have Happily said yes. He, Mike, if you're listening. He didn't want... No, the date wasn't with him. Calm oh. down. Oh. <laughs> he said, if you can answer his <laughs> quiz right, that you win a date with John. And I was like, okay. <sighs> Wait, he's auctioning me off? Yes. Like I'm some piece of meat. You don't even get a cut. <laughs> <laughs> what is the love life update? You know, you were single the last time we, we were speaking about this. Are you still single? I'm just... Yeah, very much. I'm just trying to spread... This knowledge doesn't sound good joy. already. Yeah, I know. It really <laughs> doesn't. doesn't. What? You rephrase and restart, okay? All Rebuild right. this from the from the ground up. <laughs> um, SDI have to say that <laughs> what I'm trying to spread is, yeah, just love, man. Just joy. I'm trying to make people happy. Yeah, but you're still seeing the same girl that you met years ago on the trolley <sighs> that you were waxing poetic about the last time we spoke about this. I Am know. I mistaken? Uh, do you want to be right? I'm right. I know I'm right. <laughs> you're right. Did you see her last night? Yeah, I did. Is this why but you're it's... so expansively philosophical today? <laughs> you want to talk about love for a while? It's because I've got three unreturned text messages. Um, <laughs> oh, boy. You <laughs> yeah, better respond really quick. Otherwise, you won't be talking to her. My anymore. last text message is, you're either busy or dead. God, I hope you're busy. <laughs> <laughs> Kinda. Kinda. So, wait. No, she's no, just no, left no. She's you... the best, and she could do so much better. Um, but I think that probably just holds true for most of what I'm going to do over the next several months. All right. Sounds good. Yeah. I wish I knew her better because I really, I don't know her at all despite- I'll bring her up there. We'll do pick it. figs. That'll be great. In the Garden of Eden, you can pick figs together and have olives. <laughs> Drink <Yeah>. my wine. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's hilarious. Oh. I'm leaving. No, no. In my head, there's a fig leaf situation. It's great. I'm out. Oh, you should leave. <laughs> We're definitely going to need some privacy. But, no, she's the best, man. And You're really, I, like, effusive I, in your I'm, praise for her, both last time and this time. I'm, I'm a little concerned. Oh, really? Because yeah. that was, like, literally me at my most inarticulate. Yeah, but maybe it's because you're <laughs> love-struck, John. Are you oh, love-struck? come on. <sighs> you're thinking about it, aren't you? I'm thinking about Brittany. <laughs> well, let's get to work. <laughs> All Bitch. right. Let's move to the LSAT world and get out of your love life. Thank you. Or Rick and Morty's love life. <laughs> so, so, what's been going on? I know there's a colon in here you want to talk about. There's always a colon, man. They're always putting out blogs. Another famous law colon fully blog has been dropped for Veterans Day, which I appreciate. Yeah. Um, it's called A Salute to Those Who Serve. And then they're talking about one military member's path uh, to a career in law. And I appreciate that. My dad was in the Navy for 30 years. So yeah. I can certainly uh, understand that lifestyle. And it is definitely a sacrifice at times. Yeah. Not on my part, but certainly on the part of service members. So We both had these bone spurs. So I, I get it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm no Kennedy. But the uh, <laughs> thumbs up to that. Well, well played. Then there's two other small pieces of news, which is, first off, there is an LSAT coming up relatively soon here in just under two weeks on Monday, November 25th. You've got the November LSAT. Mm -hmm. That means, though, that also the January LSAT registration deadline is coming up, and that comes up in the early part of December on December 3rd. So, 
That's the next LSAT that you can register for. That yeah. is January. You have to like the fact that they've at least given about a week between those two dates. Between so the you can, test, yeah. but Well, you can take the LSAT in November and contemplate. Right. You can even is... cancel and then decide if, if December is going to be maybe the next attempt you want, or January, but the December sign up date. Uh, okay, but can we speak about what would be the optimal perfect world or yeah, closer I know to perfect? What it is, but go ahead. Perfecter? Perfecter. <laughs> that would be to shorten the score release timeline down to about seven to 10 days and then to push back the registration deadline for the following test so that you can get your scores for November prior to the registration deadline for January. That would be the optimal situation here. It would. Um, I, I hope you'll indulge me on this. Have I already? I know, well, you always do. We're about <laughs> to do a student mailbag episode. Um, but there is a question that I keep getting asked, and it's not a part of the mailbag, but you just reminded me of it. Hit it. Hit it. So, one... Is the score or the scale determined beforehand, and why does it take so long? Uh, that is a question that has come up so frequently I know. in I'm recent really days. I'm really jumping the gun. No, it's a fair it. question since that. we're talking about this very issue of score release registration deadline. Yeah. Uh, which one do you want me to address first, or do you want to address? No, no, no. By all means, you go. Well, it is set beforehand in large part. So it is not set afterwards. They don't conform what uh, the scaling is for each test to how people performed on that test. That would create widely varying outcomes. Instead, because of experimental section pretesting, they have an excellent idea of what people are going to do as a collective. They don't know what you're going to do or someone down the street's going to do, but on the whole, they understand this is about how many people will get this right from a percentage standpoint. This is about the percentage that will get this wrong and so forth. So you'd call it like a rough estimate of the bill curve, yeah. but I not think a it's, perfect one. It's better than rough. It's, okay. they, say, they walk in and they say to themselves, barring some kind of unforeseen problem, this is what it's going to look at. Now, can they make adjustments? Of course they can. We've seen some weird scales out there. They can move things around a little bit if they feel like the outcome isn't matching up to the way they look at percentiles. But it's really important for people to remember that percentiles aren't generated on a test-by-test -test basis or even a year-by-year -year basis. Percentiles use a rolling three-year pool. So that's a lot of people. It's very hard to move those percentiles when you have three years worth of test takers that you're feeding into. So there are some adjustments. I think we, we can say that confidently. But by and large, the people who make the, the LSAT, we've said it a million times, they are top notch. I feel like they're the best, if not you know, certainly among the best in the industry. And this test is really, really well made. It's one of the reasons that we appreciate it so much. Yeah. They know what they're doing. They walk in and they're like, this is what we think the 170 is going to be. They can go through each score and say, this is how we think it's going to you know, play out and it's all computer driven and they've got full scale analysis and psychometrics breakdown. So that's their story, at least as far as the scale being made. So it's largely predetermined, but not entirely. It's subject to change after the fact were something to come about that would influence it. Yeah. I like to say that it's at least 95% predetermined. I think that's a fair estimate. So, and again, to piggyback on that, why does it take so long, even for a digital test whose results they know immediately, presumably? Why does it take so long for them to turn that around if they're not sitting there tweaking the scale and tinkering? Because they're writing letters to their girlfriends. <laughs> <laughs> That's why it takes me so long to respond to emails. <laughs> <laughs> Your rhapsodic missives uh, yes. that arrive in the middle of the night. I'm sure That's, she waits and finds uh, for them. Uh, no. I'm sure she wakes in fear of them. But yes. I yes. would. But can we focus, David? I am I am focused. I just you're have not. to have a you know, if you're gonna leave the gate open, <laughs> I'm gonna let the horses out. All right. All right. But it's the the important thing is that those horses carry the letters. Yes, they do carry those letters. You're using the Pony Express again. I, I am. Why does it take so long? Well, first off, it doesn't have to. We know that they can score tests in as little as 48 hours, probably mm -hmm. instantaneously. We've, We've seen, seen new mass before. score releases on a five-day turnaround. Uh, 
Yeah. We've seen yeah. large test center scale releases on five days. I've seen individual scores come back two days later. So I know they can do it. Um, but the problem is, is when you have 30,000 test takers, you run into a set of issues that is more challenging. You know, in the old days, it used to be, well, you have to ship everything back to them and they'd have to wait for it. And we don't have that problem quite as much with the electronic aspect, but we have a different problem recently, which is there's been a lot of makeup tests. I'm not going to go into detail about the problems that they've had with various administrations. We've covered it. Yeah, Yeah. we've covered it. Last episode, we covered it. But if somebody has to make a test up, typically the makeup is one week and more often two weeks later. Mm -hmm. And so right away, you think about score release being on a rough three-week timeline. If someone's taking the test two weeks later, they, you know, you can't release everyone else's score before they've taken the test. So they've built in some room there. They also have to go ahead and make sure that they run all the integrity checks and really what they would call them as validity checks Mm -hmm. and make sure that the results are valid. They did this with July and they thought they were going to need a really long time and they were able to do it a week faster. But that's just, you know, that's the psychometrics of the test where you have to analyze it and say, did people perform as expected? Is it providing valid results? Are all the questions performing as we expected? For example, if you had a logical reasoning question and you said to yourself, well, I think 65% of test takers will get this right. And that was what your history told you. And you knew what the wrong answers were going to scale out as. And then all of a sudden on the day of the test, only 15% of the people got it right. Something's wrong. Yeah. It's so far off your expectation. Now you need to sit down and, and go work through that. Does that take 10 minutes? No, it might actually require like a committee meeting to look at the question and try to figure out what happened, whether that's thrown the rest of the test off. And sometimes you see questions. Yeah, whether the question should even stay as part of the scoring. Yeah, sometimes you see questions removed. And so they have to go through this integrity to make sure that the results that they're producing match the standards that they've set. And their standards are, in the test development department, very high. So it takes a while. And we've said many, many times that what they should do is, okay, look, if all those things are true and they have to double check everything, don't give me a scaled score. Don't tell me that I got you know, a 160. Tell me instead that your raw score, according to what we have right now, is unofficial and is 65 correct. Yeah. It's the Voldemort of tests to mention, but the GRE does this. Yep. The GMAT does this. So there's two right. Voldemorts now. There's two. Harry there's Potter's a got a lot more dangerous. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Harry's in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the fact of the matter is, a lot of these other computerized tests give raw scores. I see yeah. no reason not to. I mean, I understand somebody goes out and they're like, they think they're going to get a certain number right. Like, my goal is unofficial to get raw score. True, but think about what happens is it increases the cancellation rate, which changes mm. the nature of the pool. If somebody's like, all right, my goal is 60, I hope I got it, and then they see their raw score is 35, they're out. So we saw that in July with 50% of the people canceling their scores when they could preview them. Yeah, I'm not saying it would be 50% because I think a lot of people took that test as a lark almost, but you'd see a higher cancellation rate, which has its own effects. I'm smirking right now because if anything, that would just drive up more money for LSAC. And I think you and I both know that's the last thing they want. Well, I think they want money. That's the last thing they need. <laughs> yeah, the last <laughs> thing they need. Money. That's, yeah, that's a good way to put it. <laughs> By the way, I will make one other comment that directly relates to this. And that is, if you do take the test, say, a week or two weeks later on a makeup, you still get your scores on the same day as everybody else. That is, yeah, that's a good point so. to make. We're going to mention an accommodations situation and accommodated test takers, no matter how much later you take the test, also get their scores on the same day. So that's really important. And I think that's a great, great policy on their part. Make sure everybody is getting it. It doesn't always work. We know there was a problem last time uh, with a huge delay for some people, but it's important to at least track what's going on with us. That's a fair point. There was one other thing. What was that? I forget. Jump us ahead. (laughs) You forgot. Um, (laughs) It happened 20 minutes ago. Right, right. So, Dave, let me tell you about your cells. (laughs) (laughs) My cells regenerated. Right. Are you saying I'm a whole new me? Let me talk to you about Danton von Leeuwenhoek. 
Yes. I'm a whole new person at this point now from this conversation. Every, I think, yeah, you might be. Uh, and was it every seven years or nine years? I forget. Anyway, there was a change that was important. Very. About LSAT writing. And this is a very recent development, as you and I have learned about it. Do you want to elaborate or should I? Yes. Just today, That's LSAC a, yeah. has announced that they are lifting the requirement that you have an LSAT writing sample submitted in order to have your scores released to law schools. And this is due to the problems they've been having. There's been widespread reporting over inability to initiate sessions or successfully close them. And I think they realized that it was now starting to delay applications. And I've seen and heard from a number of students who were furious. Like, I missed the first day of early decision applications because I've been trying for two weeks to get my LSAT writing done. Yeah, so, so many little issues that were coming up that were ultimately like restarting the process for people. That's exactly right. So Their ID wasn't clear as they held it up, or the room wasn't scanned correctly, or they weren't sure about their you know, scratch paper, or I could go on. Yeah. So what they came out with was a statement that says, we will be releasing scores for the multiple choice portion of the LSAT. So the portion that we're always talking about, the 120 to 180 portion, to candidates and to the law schools to which candidates apply or have applied as soon as the scores are available, even if candidates have not yet completed their writing sample. So this applies to anyone who's dealt with like the, uh, the new online format. Yeah. If you've got a writing sample already done, no worries. But for those of you struggling or those of you who haven't done it yet, let's say you just took, say, the October test and haven't completed the writing sample, at this point you can apply without one. Through April of 2020, as I understand it. So I know that, you know, we won't cite the percentages. It wasn't a huge percentage of people, but as usual, if this is if you're one of the people that it happened to, it's devastating. Yeah. And so they have moved to release that problem. And I know that for those people, there's a huge sigh of relief right now. Like, all right, now I cannot worry about this. And, you know, it just it's anxiety, it's more stress. And then their scores go out instantly. And the schools can start making their consideration. Yeah. Man, I know you've seen it. I watched people try three or four times to complete a writing sample to submit this cycle, and they couldn't get it done. Well, usually if you have a problem, you're sidelined for seven to ten days. Yeah. And if that keeps happening, you're like, well, well. And then a lot of times people, they're like, I'll do it later. I'll do it right beforehand. I mean, everyone has that that gene a little bit. And then all of a sudden, it becomes a problem. And we were saying in the last episode, do your LSAT writing. Get There's been a lot of done. problems with yeah, it. Get it done. It's not going to be as easy as you might think. Well, this actually is a huge, to me, I think, safety net. So good for, good for LSAT. I was just going to say that. Let's give credit where credit is due. They recognized a problem again, and they have addressed it. This yeah. is the LSAT that I like. This so, is the LSAC I like too. Yeah, All I right. love this. <laughs> Everybody knows there was a problem. It's been widely reported. There's been a lot of complaints. Let's not hide it. Let's go ahead and address it and take care of the issue. And they did the smartest thing, which was, all right, let's get the scores out. This is this is the way to do it. So yeah. congrats to Agreed. them on that. Yeah. High five, guys. You don't often hear that here. So <laughs> I like being able to do that. I'm generally a very positive person, but this year has been... Interesting. It's been hard to compliment, but this is definitely a step in the right direction. So good that for them. right. Yeah, yeah. I think we're gold there. All right. What else? What let's, else? Let's move Let's get on. to the students, huh? Yeah. Let's get to the actual selection of questions. And I will preface this by saying that if you have questions, send them to us because <laughs> we compile them and we choose the ones that are easiest for us to talk about in, in this type of environment. So if your question is not being answered, we apologize in advance. Usually I try to respond to those that I know that we won't be able to talk about. So, <laughs> it's Yeah, it's not us, it's you. <laughs> it is mostly me. That's what you said. Even though you're the one who likes to write letters more so Come than I Come on, do. dude. It's All right. never going to stop, bro. <laughs> oh, I know. Never, ever going to I'm stop. Just, I'm glad you didn't bring up that Reddit thread that I've oh, now just brought up. I'm just holding that <laughs> in my pocket. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like a death crystal in my pocket. Oh, Rick and Morty throwback. Except well I'm going to see your demise, not mine. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> oh, if I can just be here to amuse you, buddy. 
That's, that's the way I like it. <laughs> I know. Let's start off with some questions that are really about some specific things <laughs> that we've seen. We'll kind of, they're really just two of them I want to get across, but they're the ones that we see all the time. Yeah. Or, and it's not even necessarily that I see them publicly. Sometimes people will write me privately and I'll, I'll refer them to posts that I've made on this. And, and most of the questions that are commonly asked, we have addressed them at some point, either in this podcast, on our blog, on our forum. I mean, I've made, I don't know how many thousands of posts on our forum. I'm, I'm very frequently on there answering questions. I think you're the leader at this point. I am number one overall in number total one. posts on the PowerScore LSAT forum. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome. I think I'm like a sad number nine or something, which is shameful. It really is. But <laughs> <laughs> Especially given oh, you your well-known writing something. proclivities. I'm and, uh, surprised. I'm too busy writing write letters. <laughs> I think you're just averse to working, bitch. <laughs> I could be it, bitch. <laughs> uh, so the question here is, and I got this one on Twitter most recently, is how much should I be diagramming? And this was around a couple of different questions. One of them related to the idea of like, every time I see a most strongly supported question, I diagram it. Mm -hmm. And then someone else was talking about the idea of, you know, how much does everybody diagram conditional reasoning? Right now I'm diagramming every instance of it. And I think you have to separate sections out here. What The way I diagram in logical reasoning is fundamentally different than in logic games. Sure. So in logic games, you're diagramming the game. That's what you do. You make a setup to kind of like the picture is worth a thousand words to make all the information very concise and easy to control. Logical reasoning diagramming is totally different to me. The default setting I know that both you and I have is not to diagram. Yeah. Well, I, I know I'm not a big diagrammer. You're minimalist. I am a minimalist. Yes, that's right. That's, so, the, that's the most complimentary way that you could put it. I think you called me lazy a minute ago. That too. Okay. A lazy minimalist <laughs> doesn't have a whole lot. It's just <laughs> redundant. But okay. I don't know that it is, actually. Once an actual <sighs> don't, mindset. Don't start. Don't start with me. Well, anyway. You're the one that said you were going to be philosophical today. <laughs> and here I engage you in a philosophical discussion of the meaning of these words. Like you're just engaging you can't me handle it. pedantic arguments. <laughs> I I don't diagram a lot because I feel like, to me, diagramming is an investment. Every the effort, every bit of time, all of that that you put into diagramming needs to reward you in excess of what you've put in. And I often find that I'm not rewarded enough to diagram. And I think if most people were were genuflect about this, if they could look back on themselves and see what they had done, what they had actually invested and gotten out of it, they would find that they should diagram less. That's my broad take. I don't disagree with that. I, I definitely agree with the idea of it being an investment. I think, though, the calculus on that investment and the return on it changes from person to person. For sure. There are some people who need to diagram. You see, your laziness when you're taking the test. Come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> I told you. Just taking be... body blows today. All right. <laughs> it's good, though. I'm I fine. know I'm enjoying it. No, it's just... I, I don't mean that in a negative sense, surprisingly. Oh, yeah, no, it sounded really positive. Go, yeah, go well, on. you'll That's see. Funny. So, your laziness on the test <laughs> manifests itself in just not writing anything. So... I don't think there's a huge problem with that. It's kind of like you don't feel the need to do it. My laziness at times is like, I just write it down really quick so that I don't have to think about it anymore. That way I kind of have it as a touchstone. So it's a different form of laziness and how it displays. I think that's fair. Mine so now, is, oh, is okay. well, I was going to say mine is manifest out of um, what are fairly humble beginnings. Because I, when I first approached this test, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know you could diagram. I didn't know you could physically write these things down. And so I did it all in my head. You know this. I do know this. And it was grisly, but it's also my, again, it's what I'm born out of. So I've, I've kind of embraced diagramming on that side of the fence. Whereas I think a lot of other people come to it and really need to pare down. I never struggled with that particular concern. I think that's a reasonable way to see this and to understand the difference in how we look at it. 
I also think this is that I'm a true believer that you want to have the ability to diagram anything you choose to diagram. So you need to master it, but then you don't need to use it all the time. And I think that's where your view and mine are completely consistent because you mm-hmm. could diagram anything that you wanted to. You just choose not to. Yeah. Let me give one other point maybe that uh, echoes where our consistencies uh, exist, which is when we teach this stuff, oftentimes the best way to represent it to someone else is to make it physical, to make it tangible. So when I show people how things operate, I just did a thing last week in a clinic uh, on formal logic, and I was using a lot of Venn diagrams. I was using lot, and things that I would never encourage, and I made this very explicit: do not do this on the test. Venn diagrams are not your friend. Let but, me interject here really quick. Yeah, go before on. you go on, mm-hmm. you mentioned clinics, and if you're not in oh. one of our full length or main live online courses. You wouldn't know what those are. Uh, (laughs) Every Friday, we do clinics for the students in those classes where they can kind of like log into our online platform and we talk about different topics. Yeah. And we go in depth for several hours on that. So when he's talking about clinics, it's basically like a live class for, you know, whoever wants to show up and then it records and everybody can access it as well. That's right. It's the equivalent of me writing you each a letter. (laughs) (laughs) See, I don't get to take shots at you anymore, but you get to take shots at yourself. No, I'm just, look, if, if you can punch me in the guts. I can take some of my own. Hmm. Um, the clinic this week, if you're going to listen to this, is a really, really good one. It's a big LR overview with a must-be-true review. It's great. So this to me is actually one of the favorite ones that I put together. Good. I'm very excited. Yeah, that's awesome to hear. And mm-hmm. so I think you know when we go back down to this and people ask me about logical reasoning diagramming, Like, for example, to make a comment like, oh, I always diagram most strongly supported questions. I'd be like, why? You can't just take one question type categorization and say that it's always conditional. It doesn't work that way. People say that about like justify or parallel. And I'm like, they don't really lend themselves to that degree of... Some do. Some don't. Some do. Some don't. Exactly. Yeah. So when when I hear that, I'm like, no, 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 you're looking at it the wrong way. It's not a matter of the question type is driving what you do do in terms of diagramming, because that's a stimulus-driven event. Can I put you on the spot a little bit and really belabor this? I guess, yeah. Here we go. That was rhetorical. Um, (laughs) What is it that would almost insist that you diagram? Is there some component, key factor, that would be like, I've got to write this down? I almost always diagram formal logic. Okay. That's like the first, if I ever start to see a bunch of sums and mosts and alls, I'm like, yeah, I'm way too lazy to just like juggle this mentally. I'm just going to put it down. Yeah. Because I can To me, it's where I see three or more repeated terms, variables. Fair enough. That would be the, that would be my second level as well is like, if I feel like I can bring clarity to what I'm looking at, or if the statement itself is particularly forceful and I wish to remind myself without like having to really store it that strongly in short-term memory. Let me actually elaborate on what you just said, forceful. What you're talking about is the strength of the language with which the author presents relationships. Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. If I see absolute terms, that to me is an early indicator that a diagram might really be worth it. If I see those terms begin to repeat themselves, I might actually pick up a pencil. God forbid. And then... Scribble you. <laughs> a missive. A missive. <laughs> so I hope end. this letter finds you will. Well, either way, I think that's actually where it comes down to. I don't really diagram an LR a tremendous amount. Yeah, we're the same. But there are times when I'm like, gosh, this is clearly conditional and they're going to do something with this. It's quite clear that this is central. I'll put it down. Formal logic, multiple statements like you mentioned, that's what I'm diagramming. I'm never saying, well, this is parallel reasoning, so I'm diagramming it. Never. There are many questions in parallel reasoning that I wouldn't even think about diagramming, and there's some that I would. That goes for almost every question type out there. You're contextually responsive, and I think that's appropriate. That's the way you have to do this, because they're not... The people who make this test are good enough to not be that predictable. And so you have to roll with the terrain. You have to change your tactics depending upon what they give you. Sometimes that means to diagram a lot. Sometimes it does not. I actually put together a blog that I'll I'll link in the uh, notes for this podcast. It's about, it's called, you know, LSAT conditional reasoning, when to diagram. (laughs) 
So, I like that blog. I've read it a couple of times and the, the gymnomism, I think that's a word, uh, that you describe in it is great. Yeah. The, the athleticism, the agility. All right, let's move on. Cool. Let's move on to the next question, which is a question I get with some, it used to be more frequent. Now it's a little bit less frequent. Somebody was asking me about the various terms that we use. Mm -hmm. Uh, and sometimes the fact that I like to trademark them, which... <laughs> yeah, speaking of diagramming, actually. Yeah, which I will address as well, although I'm pretty sure I've addressed this before. Specifically, they were asking me about unified grouping theory, which is something that it was just kind of, I mean, honestly, a tongue-in-cheek name that I came up with, because I was like, I'm going to try to fit it all together. And I think I'd been watching like Star Trek or something. <laughs> and I was like, yes, unified field theory. I was like, I'm going to do a unified grouping theory. There you go, some Roddenberry influence. Well it, it, it attracted me, though, because I like having words that I can use that very quickly convey an entire set of ideas. When we say mistaken reversal, for example, once you know what it is, I don't have to stop and explain from a conditional standpoint what the error is that's occurring. I'm just like, it's a reversal. Do we see this? Awesome. Let's move on. I don't have to go back and rebuild it. And that's the value of having code words, so to speak. It's also like when people join groups, why it takes a little bit of time for them to kind of like enmesh themselves because they don't know the language of a group. The LSAT has its own language. Um, and so there were really two questions here, which is, why do you always put trademarks on that stuff? <laughs> <laughs> and then secondly, do I really need to know it? So I'll address the trademark thing first, because I always laugh about this. Uh, the reason I do that is because in the early days, I didn't. And now some of the stuff that I created is um, widely used by various you know, people and companies out there. And that didn't make me the too words, happy. The words, the ideas, or both? Uh, well, the ideas, you know, from a copyright law standpoint, you can't protect the ideas, but some of the right. specific words uh, have been taken. And so what I discovered was if I didn't make a show of protecting it, people would just grab it mm -hmm. and they will still grab the ideas. I mean, I've, I've looked at some books out there where I'm like, mm, I know where this came from, but <laughs> they put it into their own words and that's fine. Uh, you got to be careful about walking the line because certainly we've addressed that with people before. But yeah. overall, you can't protect ideas. You can only protect the presentation of ideas. So for any of you future lawyers who are interested in intellectual property, that's uh, you know, a fundamental piece of information there. Was it Socrates who said the beginning of any like good idea starts with the definition of terms? Well, I would agree with that. Let me tell you about the history of Carolus Linnaeus. Now, <laughs> Prince Botanicus, that was his own self-moniker. He invented... I'll stop. stop. Okay. <laughs> I can't hear it. Should we talk about King Clovis and Queen Clotilde? Happily. Anyway. Happily. The, uh, he was a freak, by the way. If anybody wants to look him up, he was a weird dude. Clovis? No, no, no. Linnaeus. Oh, okay. I was yeah. like, I'm not sure. Yeah. The uh, the the man of modern nomenclature. How do we like, get on this topic? We're talking about naming things. Forget it. Okay. Anyway, so that's why I actually have used the trademarks. I'm like, no, I really <laughs> would prefer that people not take this term and that it is is for us to use because some of the stuff I really love and I didn't want it stolen. The question then is, is well, do I really need to know every every term? And my answer to that is always, I think, surprising to people. No. Yeah, yeah. It's always caught me off guard that you're so non-defensive. Well, I'm... In a good way. Like, I mean, it's obviously correct. But. Would I prefer that someone knows what the words mean? Yes, totally. But it's not the hill I'm going to die on. Right. You're about the idea. I'm about the idea. I always tell people this. I don't care whether you know if it's a mistake in reversal or not, but you damn well better know <laughs> what actually a mistake in reversal is. Because This that, is, by the way, easily our worst language. I know, dude. Oh, Seriously. Yeah. The Bitch. language is bad. I can't even let my seven-year-old listen to this. <laughs> <laughs> but, but to your point, sorry to interject. No, but uh, to my to point, interrupt is really what that was. To it's point. not about the uh, the names. The names are a convenience factor, so that we don't have to repeat the entire definition as we go through it. As long as you know what it is that we're talking about and you understand conceptually what's occurring, you're good. Something like unified grouping theory is really like this overarching idea of like, well, what are you looking at when you look at grouping games? What are all the physical characteristics of how they construct a logic game so that you can break it down as clearly as possible? 
you know, the number of groups that are there, how many spaces in each group, how many variables are there, are you using all the variables, do you have too many variables, not enough variables, all these are points of analysis that you need to make instantly, not slowly, not like, let me check this out, <laughs> all right, you're not 80 yet. And it's not casual, it's not like, these aren't arbitrary things, they have to happen, you have to make these determinations. Yeah, we've been rather expansive, to use your word, in this <laughs> podcast. That is not how I take the LSAT. I'm a Terminator machine when I'm going through this, and I'm looking at it instantly. Look at that. That's interesting. That's unusual. This is different. I'm looking at that argument, and I don't like it. Yeah. All things like this are going through my head at a really fast rate of speed. It's not like, boy, that author's really interesting <laughs> argument they're making. Boy, I wouldn't mind having a beer with them. Huh, what do you know? It's another logic game. Maybe I'll... It's not that. It's very deliberate. It's very precise. Can I actually... Uh, while we're being expansive, can I elaborate on a point I made to someone online the other day since this is a student question? Yes, of course. So, yeah. So, they had talked to me about the idea of, look, I'm really good when I practice. I really struggle when the real thing happens. I, I freak out. I panic. My anxiety. And... They were like, is there anything I can do to combat this sense of, like, real thing nervousness? And I said, the only thing I really know to be universally successful in this is a routine. And so what you're talking about, uh, and this is where I'll try to tie it back in, was there are three things I do at the outset of every logic game. Three things. The first, I always identify what the variable sets are, even if they're obvious, even if they are intuitive and self-evident. I always care about that. Second, I always choose a base. If I can, most games allow you to. Sometimes, again, it's obvious. Not always. But these are the first two steps I always take. And the third step, and this is really getting to your point, Dave, I always focus on the numbers. And this is really where the unified grouping theory, regardless of if you memorize the names or not, will see you through a rough time. It will get you through to the sunshine, as it were. Oh, because people. if you're focused on the numbers, you can always make good decisions about not only those first two elements I just described, but about the most controlling factor in every single game. You talked about this a lot in the September test, the, the power of the numbers. There's a secondary point to this, which is people ask about speed a lot. Mm. Well, s consistent application of ideas and analysis allows you to go faster. You see things through a lens of like, I've seen this before, and this leads to this, or I haven't seen this before, that's unusual, maybe I should slow down. You yeah. become a better analyzer and a faster test taker by understanding these are the things I want to look at initially when I go through something like a logic game. That's a really good way to put it. There's almost like this predetermined momentum. Yeah. Yeah. It's not random. I mean, I think sometimes people are like, oh, you're just kind of like casually looking at it. Uh-uh. It is the exact opposite of that. It is pure concentration and focus. Here's what I love about this is you and I had a conversation. It feels like six years ago, but it probably was just a couple of weeks, uh, where we described this test in slightly different ways. And I said it was like a, a ballet. And you said it was a street fight. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I remember that. It was actually relatively recently. <laughs> yeah. But in both cases, the point wasn't that it was random. The point wasn't that it was just this unorchestrated sense of, you know, irrhythmic moves. We both had a real sense of what we were trying to accomplish. Yours, violent. Mine. <laughs> Graceful. Graceful. <laughs> Yeah, it was forceful and with purpose. It's just that the actual application of those two things comes out differently depending yeah. upon how we're going through it. Sure. And that's I, not to I say... Just, I'm not, we're I think not, that's I beautiful, say, man. I think there's actually some poetry in that. Let me tell you about poetry. Shut up. Okay. <laughs> I knew exactly where you're going with this. <laughs> you did? Yeah. I was trying to let like me climb tell the mountain you again. About some uh, let me fact. tell you. What? So Rudyard Kipling wrote this amazing line of verse. Quiet now. Okay. Okay, okay. Let's go on. Let's let's throw in some other questions that are a little broader than those two. Even I think those are great platforms. I mean, I can honestly talk about like the use of of names and the way to approach things uh, and what those ideas represent quite a bit. Diagramming more. itself is fascinating. So oh, yeah. yeah, we could do that for a while. It'd be great to put in some examples. Maybe we should do that in a future episode. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Talk about diagramming? All right, diagram this. I'll write you a letter. Please do. <laughs> so somebody, in fact, somebody almost every week asks me on Reddit, what's the difference between the LSAT Bibles, the LSAT Bible workbooks, and then the LSAT training types? You know what? I think I'm just going to let you run with this. You think? I might yeah. know a little bit about these books. Hey, no. Your hey, name now. is on all the covers, but yeah, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my daughter's begun to realize that I've actually like written some of these books and they're much bigger than the, you know, the books that she has. And she said, did it take a long time? I'm like, years, years, years and years. We told a story. I'm actually, I, I was thinking about this the other day. Just bear with me for a second. You'll like this. Do you remember on that trolley ride with that girl mm -hmm. whose name remains unnamed? Seasonal. <laughs> yes. Do you remember why you were able to hang out with us that day? It's because you had taken a break from the Logical Reasoning Bible, the very first edition. 2000, I think it was 2004, dude. Am I right about this? You've got to be. It's close to that particular yeah. point. Yeah. I remember you just looking haggard and disheveled. <laughs> You're just being like, there's this thing. That's because this I've been drinking albatross. for five hours <laughs> in the tournament it. at that point. Jeez. <laughs> that explains the typos. <laughs> that was the Heritage Golf Tournament on Hilton Head, which yeah. if you've never been to a golf tournament and if you've never been to Hilton Head, that is a great one to go to. It's one of the biggest parties on the tour. Yeah, I actually have friends that play on the tour and it is their favorite tournament of the year every time because it is the party week. I I've gotten so drunk with Ian Poulter. I've done the same with Darren Clark, where it was like go. two in the morning in, in Harbor Town. <laughs> yeah. I'm actually, at least as far as those books, I, I am pretty well known. When I'm on like project, I will not, I cannot be, be turned from it. When I was writing the original Logic Games Bible uh, manuscript, I, we had these really just incredibly close friends down the street and it was her birthday. And she this. was like, we're having a big party, you know? And I was like, I won't be there. <laughs> I'd love to mention they, their restaurant. But they could not believe it. They're like, you won't come out for our birthday? I was like, absolutely not. <laughs> yeah, this... that we snuck you away for that Saturday, Sunday, whatever it was at the Heritage <laughs> was a minor miracle. Yeah. Yeah. Probably so. But <laughs> e either way, when I said Did earlier, anyone? I have like a Terminator focus on this. I definitely do. I can just block out everything else in my life and do it. But going so, back to I was those... thinking about that the other day. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah, the, the, the three books are meant to work together, but they are distinctly different. And there is definitely like, you know, the kind of like the kingpin, or you could even call it the base of the pyramid, whatever. The most important of those three types of books are the LSAT Bibles themselves. And that is, of course, the place to start if you're reading any of these. And the reason is, is these are the books that explain the, con the concepts and the methods and the strategies that we use to attack and solve questions. So it's almost like this is where you get your tools. Here's the tool shed. Let's start getting better and better tools. Let's learn more about how to use them and, you know, walk out the door like, all right, at least I know what this tool is and what it's supposed to do. A lot of times with students, what they would do is they'd go through and they're like, I still don't feel 100% comfortable with some of these ideas. Could you, do you have anything you can give me that would like work on this particular skill or this particular idea? That's where the LSAT Bible workbooks came from. They give you more drills, and they're based on the material in the LSAT Bibles. So if you just pick up a workbook, some of it will make sense, but a lot of it won't, because you need to have read the Bible first. So at that juncture, the idea is to actually help you build those skills and make them better. It is a skill-building series of books. It's designed to improve your knowledge of what you've already learned in the LSAT Bibles. and then. Obviously, a lot of this was driven by students and questions and requests. They're like, well, I'm still having problems with this type of question, like assumptions, for example, or grouping games are killing me. And so what we did was we put together the LSAT training type books, which are purely for practice, but separate out all the different types of questions that you're seeing so you can isolate an attack. Are you bad at parallel reasoning? All right, here's 40 of them. Yeah. That kind That's of really thing. the application side. It's the total application side. So if the LSAT Bibles are what gives you the skills, the workbooks build them and make them stronger and more robust. And then the training type allows you to practice over and over again until you're able to refine your usage and you can become as good as possible. Yeah. And there you go. Yeah. To me, I think the most, 
undersold, overlooked uh, element in this is the workbooks. I think those are so incredibly valuable, but people don't always appreciate what they're for. I think you just did a great job of uh, explaining that. I try, man. I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah, you succeed. Well, let's move on to the next question, which was actually about accommodations, and I kind of uh, alluded to it. And this came in on Twitter. And one of the things that happened was there was a student with accommodations for the November 25th test. And the accommodations have been confirmed, so that's good. But then the proctor or whoever the test site administrator was moved the testing back to December 3rd. And I think that freaked the student out. Accommodation students don't often realize that sometimes they take the test on the same day as everyone else, but oftentimes they don't. Yeah. And so the question was, does this mean since it's not in the same month that it'll be a different test? It could be the same. It might not be. Okay, good. I was hoping you weren't going to commit to anything. <laughs> we don't know. So it, it's been both. There's, a, there's examples where this accommodations test is the same. There's examples where it's different, whether it's a week or two later. So I can't. We just don't know anymore. Yeah. Uh, Do you have any interest in shading your... Nope. Okay. Then the next question was, is, <laughs> could this be a recycled test? And a couple of years ago, I would have been like, you know, if it was a different test, very much likely to be a recycled test. I can say that right now they appear to be going through a process of, of testing a bunch of new exams. Yeah. It's they not even appear. They're clearly doing it. Yeah. Uh, maybe I should shade that less. <laughs> shade that less, yeah. They're testing a bunch of sections right now. They're putting together new tests. It looks to me as if they're preparing for the, you know, life with 10 LSATs a year. So I'm not seeing a whole lot of test reuse at the moment. Yeah. F for those of you who are listening who are like, what does that mean? It doesn't mean anything. Nothing. Yeah, there's no fear. There's no positivity there. Now, for those of us who are talking, what does that mean? How are you preparing for life with 10 LSATs, Dave? Uh, is there is there enough Paloma? <laughs> <laughs> There's not enough tequila in the world to help prepare, so prepare me for a world of 10 LSATs a year. Yeah. Then the last question here was, will <laughs> adcoms think I took it under accommodations since they will see a December as opposed to the November LSAT listed? Well, first off, they won't see it as December. They'll see it as November. And they won't, it won't be flagged because accommodated tests are not flagged uh, any longer. So from that perspective, they'll see December and they won't even give it a second thought. Which leads to the secondary question. If they see December versus, say, September, and they knew September had really tough logic games, how does that influence their thinking? And the answer is, it does not influence their thinking at all. And adcoms do not care about which LSAT you took and whether or not the RC was tough or the LG was tough, it's completely irrelevant to them. They just see the score and they're done. They yeah, trust what's slightly LSAT. uncharacteristic of us in this, sorry to interrupt you, no, go ahead. is that we've actually been, I would say, reasonably complimentary to LSAC uh, and specifically the standards to which they hold themselves as they build this test. And the scoring scale, the universality uh, of difficulty to me, the consistency is one place where that really holds up. Agreed. And schools know it. So if you take a test from 2017, if you take a test from a week from now, two weeks from now, schools are going to look at those as equivalent. That's exactly right. Yeah. All right. So let's move on from that. Okay. Let's hit a question that uh, somebody asked us uh, I think they post it on YouTube underneath the podcast, or maybe they sent it to us in an email. Could be. I think this circles around one of maybe my all-time favorite blog articles that you've ever written. One and of mine, You've too. written some real gems, so that says something. Yeah. That's a very complimentary thing of you to say. Well, I'll write coming, you a letter about it. No, well, I mean, coming from a writer of your stature, it certainly <laughs> makes me feel a lot better about myself. <laughs> yeah. You'll be hearing about it uh, via carrier pigeon. How long do you think couple. that I can keep this joke running about, like, criticizing your I assume until I die. Oh, good. Yeah, I assume forever. Where's my death crystal so I can see when that is? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the question is Thursday. one of the most it's frequent Thursday. ones. It's Thursday. Yeah, Thursday. All right, let's finish this first. Then. Okay, let's try. It revolves around the idea of, 
I've been taking practice tests and I've been scoring about the same or slowly moving up. Let's say, for example, I've been 161, 162, then I had another 162, then a 161, then a 164. And now all of a sudden the test is a week away and I've just scored a 157. What do I do? The short answer is you don't do anything. <laughs> the longer answer is you're going to yeah. stop and take a look at that test and see exactly what happened. But should you panic over uh, a reversal of fortune at any point in the process, uh, but especially within a week or two of the LSAT? Oh, no, no. In fact, that's the last thing you want to do. You don't need to. Right. The, the truth of this is that LSATs are made in different ways. They all are supposed to produce the same results on the whole. That does not mean they produce the same results for you, the individual. Some exams are better for me and some exams are worse for me. That's mm -hmm. true for everybody. You and I have talked about this. Like, I think we've actually given specific yeah. examples of what would be good for what we good like. and bad for us. Yeah. Yeah. Now, for example, if you're great at conditional reasoning and you feel you utterly dominate it, you recognize it, know when it's being used in an important way and feel generally comfortable, what do you want to see on the LSAT? <laughs> A lot of conditional reasoning. All of it. Yeah. Every question. But let's say you, you also, causality just is a little squishy to you. You don't feel so great about it. What don't you want to see? Conditional well, reasoning. And guess Wait. what? There are tests out there where it's a lot of causality and not that much conditionality. Yeah. That's not a good test for you. That's the kind of test where you go out and now you've, your score has dropped four or five points. Again, I did that clinic last week and had a conversation with people about formal logic. Same exact idea. If you can see three or four questions of formal logic, granted, that's not a huge proportion. But if you can and you're good at it, happy days. Versus the person who's maybe unfamiliar. That's the person who doesn't want to see causality. I've said this before, um, but a bit, again, self-revealing. I would much rather have two sets of games, experimental and real, and have them be as hard as possible. That's my dream day. Reading comp? Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, I'll write a letter. I don't want to read it. So, <laughs> the, <laughs> nice. That's well yeah, played. Thanks. All right. The uh, idea being that there are certain days that really do fall into your favor. This is also why scores get represented along a range mm -hmm. plus or minus two to three points up and down. That's your score band. It's plus or minus three, typically. Typically. It's the people who make the test saying, look, it's not precise. To them, a 161 and a 162, there's not really a statistical difference there. So you're going to have some movement. And I wrote an article about this called Welcome to the LSAT Casino, which is what you were referring to earlier. I've already been bragging on it. I can't recommend it highly enough. It's a great piece of literature. There's, there's actually two uh, <laughs> blogs that kind of go along this idea. The, the other one's called Luck in the LSAT. And with luck in the LSAT, I talk about all the things that can go the right way or the wrong way for you on the day of the test. You know, maybe you get lost driving over there, or maybe mm. there's a weather problem, or maybe the proctor didn't have his coffee and he's upset. Yeah, the AC breaks and it's hot, or the heater breaks and it's cold. Like, there's a thousand of these. Your chair squeaks. The guy behind you's got a head cold. Yeah, there's a million examples of this that are really out of anyone's control. But the LSAT casino is about the test itself. And what it basically says is when you walk in to take an LSAT, you are really rolling the, does, the dice or you're mm -hmm. spinning the roulette wheel, however you want to like put it out there. And what you're really hoping for is a test that matches your strengths, that they test the ideas that you know really well a lot and they avoid the ideas that you're weak on. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, you can see some great, great results. You're like, gosh, I just jumped up a couple of points. And then the next time you go d back down and you're like, oh, that's because there's natural variation in the results. And the casino tells you that sometimes you're going to win and sometimes you're going to lose. Yeah, the content of the test itself changes from one to the next. But they're equated so that it shouldn't have a huge impact overall, but you will see minor variations. Yeah. The larger variations that I think people see, to me, uh, tend to be psychological. Oh, it's and devastating. This is a rabbit hole, dude. I don't know how far we really want to go. I think we actually, we stop right here by simply saying, don't allow yourself to get dragged down by one reversal score. 
something that goes against your trend. Treat it for what it is. It happens. An anomaly, an outlier. Yeah, real champions look at something like that and they, first off, dismiss it as indicative of who they are. And secondly, they use it as motivation to come back the next time and do even better. Yeah. Don't let it it undermine you. That's a really, really important thing. You have to be positive about your own abilities and realize that, I mean, in the words of Taylor Swift, you got to shake it off. Shake it off, bitch. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's like when Steph Curry goes one for 10, he's still a great three-point shooter. It's just a bad night. Not right now with the broken hand, but well, I don't know. he will I, be again. Yeah, I don't actually pay attention to sports, but yeah. Well, there you go. Sure. Yeah, so I think it's one of those things. Don't over-focus on singular events and realize that the long-term trend isn't affected by one lower score when you're preparing. So let's leave it at that. Well, that's a topic we'll come back to, I'm sure, many times in the future because it's just... it's. I hope so. It's one of the most fascinating things about this whole yeah. adventure, frankly. There's more, more to talk about even with LSAT mentality that we have yet to get into, which is coming soon. I know. I'm actually looking forward to that podcast. You Should and we I do did one more? Really... Yeah, let's see one more. We'll do one more. I've I know got you're... time. I've got to go get a haircut, but... <sighs> Not me, man. I haven't had a haircut in ages. Yeah, yeah. I, I can tell. Go on. <laughs> you said before you thought it looked good. <laughs> <laughs> you, you got a great head of hair, buddy. You got a great head of hair. <laughs> I don't know about that. I decided Your I'm Navy going. father, I'm sure, is furious. He doesn't like you it. Gotta it. No. Uh, you always used to say that in high school. When are you getting your hair cut? I'm like, cut your hair, boy. I'm going for my Keanu Reeves kind of like uh, silhouette. That's yeah, you got a real point break vibe happening. I dig it. <laughs> Johnny Utah. Johnny what's, Utah. <laughs> what's next? All right. Let's talk about the Khan Academy. Oh, God. I'm we'll close out with this one. All right. The question that I, that we often get, everybody knows that Khan Academy has a so-called free LSAT course that they've done in conjunction with LSAC. And I won't even talk about the conflict of interest there. <laughs> the, the, the people who make the test should not be in the business of saying, oh, we're going to teach you how to solve the test because they have no incentive to do so. So I think it's disingenuous. I'll Which just explains say that. why their solutions are so bad. Yeah, I think this explains some of the deficiencies in the course, (laughs) which again, this isn't just my opinion. These have been widely discussed online. But sometimes I get questions from students who are like, so should I even use con? And I always say the same thing about this. Yes, it's free tests. Why wouldn't you take free tests from LSAC and use them? I don't see anything wrong with that. I would recommend that to anybody who is coming into the LSAT. The thing about the Khan Academy, and you know, if someone out there is like, well, you guys are biased. Yeah, for sure we're biased. We're also experts at this. We know what we're talking about. I know what good LSAT teaching is. I know who knows LSAT concepts and who can explain them in the world of, of, of this test. We also have a different agenda, and I think this is important too. This sure. has to like underlay the foundations of what it is that we give people versus what it is the test makers themselves would. Which is to say, why in the world would they show you how to beat their own test? Yeah, they'd have to start all over again. Yeah, that's our job. It's not their job. And and in many respects, my view of the Khan Academy uh, endeavor, enterprise, whatever you want to call it with with LSAC. I could call it some things. Yeah, I could too. Is it's really good PR for them. And so kudos to the PR department. Kudos to the idea of 10 free LSATs out there. I love it. But sometimes when people ask us, they're like, well, what are the pros and cons? And we always have a laugh because we're like, <laughs> did you say cons? What are the cons? I'm <laughs> sitting yes. here actively biting my tongue at to what you just said. Oh, dude, you can't. You can't, oh, yeah? Am I, so uh, excellent. Give me free reign. Oh, no, not the con thing. That's just objectively hilarious. Yes. Uh, no. The pros and cons. And no, also the, the idea that the others, yeah, right. Go. Matches with con. Of course it does. <laughs> <laughs> The idea that there's 10 free LSATs, the idea that the entire endeavor behind this has been about accessibility, has been about, look, we want to make this test free to all, basically. And they go so far as to not let Khan use their interface. Wonderful. They go so far as to put three tests up on their own website using their interface that won't give you a score. Excellent. It's still developmental. Strong work, guys. It's I know, but this is why I sit here and kind of like, 
It, I feel a bit defeated by John, this is the difference between companies that actually do test preparation <laughs> and would be under severe scrutiny versus somebody trying to, hey, talk about we're, we're giving solutions. And you know what? It is free. Yeah, I mean, there are tests on there that are actual tests. I don't criticize that. I think that's great. That is good for accessibility. And that's fair. I can say we wouldn't last six minutes if we behaved similarly. Uh, we would under be heavy criticism. We also wouldn't last that long if our course was of the quality of what's been made there. And I say that with no reservation whatsoever. No, I, I didn't hear any hitch in your voice. No. <laughs> there are criticisms. The cons that you see about the Khan Academy tend to be things like, well, they repeat the questions over and over. That it's not really a course. It's just a series of explanations and not necessarily incredibly cohesive ones either. And so when I look at things like that, those are negatives. My, my big fear is actually that somebody who has no real experience with the LSAT will go in, use that, and think, I'm ready, and then go out and get torn apart on the real test. I also wish, you know, if you're going to do this, make them all free. Mm. You know, don't just do 10. Do them all. Yeah. Um, well, it's not going to happen. No, I know. We know that. But it would be great if they would actually Pipe do dreams. something like that. Um, yeah, I mean, it would, be, it would be great if they did that. It'd be great if their explanations were any good. Uh, that's not on LSAC, by the way. That's on Con. No, yeah, yeah. No, I, I realize we can, I think, separate the complaints or the, the criticisms. Yeah, my criticism here, just for anybody who's uncertain, is it's not against LSAC. Maybe the motive on this was more PR than actual, like, we really want a true solution. But the execution by Khan Academy on this is not great. There were problems with their SAT implementation that we're aware of. I think the LSAT's a much harder test than the SAT, and I see I see problems here that they're just they're excellent. Yeah, you know, I think it's easy for us to to sound self serving in this, and I hope we don't. Um, their execution is just straight D minus, man. It's just not. Not good. The fact that we put this out as a free public resource, I would like to think, speaks to our own uh, intentions. Yeah. I mean, the 10 tests are great. It's a good place to start. I, Like I said, I don't understand why they don't put them all out there. They have the ability to put them out there for free. All they have to do is ask LSAC for that. We have our own practice tests that are online, and yeah. we have to pay for the, the rights to, to put that out there, both – uh, you know, especially for actually using the questions. So we can't put them out there for free, but at least maybe we I have. should make the point. Sorry to jump in, but maybe I should make the point that the tests that we sell on our website, which are amazing, by the way, you should go get them. We're not making a profit on those tests. This is not some sort of you and I aren't, you know, building second pools. Well, we're way in the hole on the whole interface. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's not exactly yeah, cheap anything, to build something like that. Uh, but yeah, we had to. Anything, we're I mean, so far behind the gun. But we're doing that because we think it's important for people to be able to access this stuff. And LSAC Con hasn't done enough. That's my personal opinion. You don't have to agree with me. I'll say it on the record. No, but I think it's important that the students get the opportunity to prepare for the test in a manner that's similar to the test. Yes. And so that's what our goal was. And uh, that's what our goal is always going to be. There you go. So we'll just continue on with that. Right. So my overall take, if you really want to summarize it, is there's some good things about Khan. I think it's great to use it for the free questions. I encourage everybody to go take the tests. Uh, I like some of the stuff about like you know the interface, but there are it's not really a course. It's just questions. Yeah. And you, the analogy that I've made before to students is this: is like you understanding methods and strategies is similar to kind of like the following situation. If I gave you a fork and said, I need you to dig a mile long trench, <laughs> I'll see you in you know, a couple of years because you're going to be like working pretty hard with that fork and you're not going to really get very far and pretty soon you're going to want to quit. Learning strategies and methods and approaches to this test is like getting better tools. So all of a sudden you're like, hey man, stop using that fork. Here's a shovel. Here's a backhoe. Yeah. Exactly. And as you get better, we take that shovel, we toss that aside, and we're like, now let's try this tractor. Now let's try this backhoe. And then pretty right. soon you're like, digging this trench isn't quite so hard. And this is why just doing questions isn't enough. It's great, but you have to start with a foundational knowledge of what it is the test makers are doing, how to approach it, how to recognize it, how to resolve it and solve it. If you don't do that, you're just digging a trench with a fork. 
Yeah. And that, to me, is what Khan Academy is attempting to do. That's a really good way to put it. I analogize this very oddly similarly uh, <laughs> to someone recently where I was like, imagine trying to eat a meal with chopsticks if you don't know how chopsticks work. Oh, it's going to be the longest meal of your life. God, that would be hilarious to watch, though. <laughs> Just <laughs> two-handed two, chopsticks. Two fists, okay, I guess yeah. I pick it up like this. Two fists stabbing. And the thing is, we can teach you how they work. Khan doesn't do a great job of that, but at least gives you the meal. It's something to eat. Mm -hmm. But oh man, but it's the mile long trench. Don't man. go at it. Yeah, don't go at it with a fork. Let's, <laughs> or let's, let's upgrade your tools, which is what our <laughs> yes. job is. And we don't often go. talk about that. I mean, we talk about the LSAT all the time, but I mean, our courses uh, and our books and everything and tutors are all we're designed. really not too self congratulatory if you think about it. No, we're trying not I mean, to be. I mean, it's boring, I am, but. You tend to hold that. I am. <laughs> I am. <laughs> Did I just hear that from you? Yeah. Nah, it's boring to do that, but I, I think we're very good at what we do, and anybody listening to this understands that at least we're knowledgeable about all this. I hope so, and I, I hope they also feel like we're being genuine. There's pros and cons. So. You know, I will say something about my father, which uh, I don't often talk about him, but he was in the Navy for years, and he, he uh, managed a lot of people there, and he used to have a sign on his wall that said, tell it like it is. And I never really understood that when I was a kid That's because awesome. I was like, what does that mean? But it was a huge sign. When he retired, they gave him this gigantic sign, I think, that was like, I don't know, 10 foot by like four feet. They said, tell it like it oh, is. Wow. And his thing was, is when people would come in and they're like describing problems or they needed help, he's like, just tell me the way that it is. Don't embellish it. Don't give me anything that I don't need. Tell it the way the truth is. And I think that's what we try to do. So on that very familial and uh, sentimental note, I'm done. You got anything You're else? You're going to ask if I have anything to add, and to that, I do not. <laughs> Tell it like it is, John. Yes, sir. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much for listening today. If you get a chance, please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or YouTube, or anywhere else you find it in the world. Give us a rating if you can. Uh, only if it's five stars, however. <laughs> and you can send us any questions that you have to LSAT podcast at powerscore.com or LSAT at powerscore.com, and we will take care of those at some point in the future. On my behalf and John's, thanks for listening and have a great week.